um, my mentor was Dr. Michelle Cox, and the name of my project was Substitution, a Short Science Fiction Story. Um, my research question was, what goes into producing a well-written, entertaining, and thought-provoking science fiction story? And this essentially had three steps for me. First, I defined what science fiction was to myself. Um, then I read a lot of science fiction. And then I finally got to write my own story or finish my own story that I already started. Um, this is a picture of Isaac Asimov who wrote the iRobot series, which is my original inspiration. Um, just so you understand some genre characteristics. Um, science fiction, it's fiction like fantasy, but they're really different. Um, the easiest way to, distinct, to tell this like, a distinction would be um, science fiction is what can be, and fantasy is what can never be. Um, Science fiction fans, what they want is they want to escape to the strange and the unfamiliar, just like a fantasy fan. But they expect me as an author to provide them with some kind of scientific explanation that makes it easy for them to suspend any disbelief they might have, which makes my job a little bit harder. Um, yeah. So that's just, I understood science fiction. And then I started reading. This is my complete reading list. Um, excluding any short stories that I did read, which there was a lot of. Um, my plan, I started with classic science fiction, and I worked my way up to what was being published now, because that's obviously what I want to see as I'm writing now. Um, while I was reading, I kept a journal. Um, I took notes on the author's style, um, the way they introduced me to this new sciencey world, and how I could maybe use this in my story. Um, like I said, the most influential ended up being iRobot. And in the iRobot series, there are these three laws of robotics. And hold on, yes, these are them. And what I did was I carried these over into my story. And my story is in some ways an extension of his stories. But while Asimov questions, he focuses on more why we need these laws in place to protect us protect us from robots and their potential, what they could do if they had free will. My story questions whether we need these laws to protect us from using these robots in negative ways. So on to my writing process. Um, this started in my first year seminar on science fiction. Our final was that we had to write a science fiction story but we didn't have to finish it. We had a page limit that we had to get up to. So unfortunately, I never had to finish in that class. Lucky for me, ATP um, let me finish it and do a lot more than I ever would have with it. Um, I brought in pieces of my summer reading and all the research I did, um, mostly in the forms of themes that I wouldn't have necessarily looked at. Like in a lot of the um, books that I read, female authors, would tend to focus on gender. And gender in a sci-fi story isn't something I would think to focus on, but it helped for my story because robots, gender is a big question. Can gender be programmed, or is it something they have to learn? Um, then I had a few challenges. Um, robot stories, like in iRobot, they reflect negatively on the robots most of the time. They're these dangerous um, machines. and they're dangerous because they're superior to us in so many ways. Um, so I had to create a way that they weren't superior to us. And I mean, we're the, cre we're the creator of them, obviously, but I gave them, they don't have emotional reasoning. They don't have this emotional intelligence that humans have, and they can't understand human desires. So in my story specifically, that ends up being a big problem for the robot. And then just another, I'm not a science major, so having my science be believable was a little bit difficult, but I figured it out, I think. <laughs> Alright, so um, I would love to have read my whole story for you guys, but that's about 40 minutes, and I'm not going to put you through that. <coughs> so just to give you a synopsis, and then I'll do a selection. Um, my story, the main character is Eliza, and she's a robot, and she's part of a political family they had her manufactured to help run their campaign on robot rights because we're at a time where, fictional time, where robots have come up so they're almost equal to us and they're really accepted. Um, as you'll see, the part, Eliza is dating a human, so 
there's, they're almost there. Um, the politics of the time are robot rights, and specifically these Asimovian laws. Are we going to get rid of them? Are we going to keep them? Um, and it, I open with a debate, like a political debate, just to kind of expose you to the three laws that I showed you earlier. Um, and then I go into more of the story. What actually, just the, what happens is her boyfriend, Robert, gets um, substituted as part of this political scandal and replaced with a robot. And it's Eliza's like mission to kind of figure out what happened, why did this happen? But because she's a robot, she can't understand a human motivation to do such a thing. So she needs the help from humans in order to solve this mystery. Um, in the end of the story, um, the Asimov's laws end up basically saving the day in a lot of ways because um, it was a human that was the culprit behind everything, a political, someone fighting for election, and they were using robots. But it wasn't, the robots were not able to do harm to any humans because of these laws. It's complicated, you'll have to read it. Um, so, I have a selection. How do I get this down? I said Steve. Um, for you. And this picks up right in the beginning of the story, right after the debate that exposed you to all those laws. Um, w. Pilgrim Hall. How could this happen? I was all but stripped down to the wires coming in here, and I'm Robert Byerly's date, for goodness sakes. The annual Founders Auction was even limited this year to the most exclusive list, to prevent any more foul play. And to think, I thought tonight would be another dull political dinner followed by drunken bidding. While I do sometimes wish I could take part in your exotic meals, intoxication is one capability, human capability, I will never envy. After the sudden vacation taken by the entire prestigious Engelberger family, great use of my tax dollars, I was sure we'd seen enough scandal for the next few months. However, Robert, as always, had his suspicions about the Engelbergers going all MIA so close to the election. The first item to be auctioned tonight was Isaac Asimov's desk. <laughs> By telling everyone that this could have been the desk upon which the original iRobot series were written, it went for a very high price. Of course, I'm thankful because the money will be great help to the campaign. At the same time, I can't understand why humans assign so much value to some objects. I could buy my own villa and live happily for years for what the bidding was up to. Not that I need much, but still. Second up for auction was the first robot prototype. Personally, I find this item much more interesting. Pity I shall never see it. When it came time to bring the prototype to the stage, it could not be found. Then, in the worst possible way to deal with this kind of situation, the auctioneers announced that it was missing, which obviously caused uproar. Humans became outraged or anxious. Robert and his father huddled and then went off in different directions to address the problem. I kept thinking that maybe someone's up to old tricks. I remembered Robert telling me about thefts occurring and wondered if this one's connected. Probably not. The last one he mentioned was, hmm, 124 days ago, and that culprit was always breaking into homes to get his goods. I think they caught him too. Some guy using an old mindless droid to do his stealing. I'm disappointed though, after seeing how much a desk went for, I can hardly imagine what the prototype would have brought in for our cause. Anyway, the prototype was stolen, everyone was upset, and the entire night was ruined. Robert left to investigate with the other Byerleys, so I have decided to head home unescorted, over the joys of dating the mayor's son. Rosam Street. My walk home is refreshing. Although I obviously don't need exercise to stay in shape, I enjoy a brisk walk every day to take in my always changing surroundings. In the city, we are constantly upgrading in whatever ways pos possible. As metallic buildings grow taller to suit our needs, more trees are planted to offset the cold modern vibe. I enjoy the little bit of nature we maintain in the midst of all the unnatural. Sorry. Our white sidewalks may be clean enough for humans to eat off of, but a shady spot in the courtyard outside my apartment building is always preferable to me. Um, it amazes me how dirty cities used to be. I've seen the filth in pictures and books from centuries before I was created. Of course, now we have robots employed to clean and maintain public property. 
Even if someone gets away with littering before being caught by a patrolling robot, the trash will remain on the ground for long. The 5.2 mile walk home, including seven flights of stairs to my apartment, takes me a total of about 15 minutes at a medium pace. Had Robert walked me home, it would have taken twice as long. Still, I'll take as much time with him as I can get. Before even crossing the threshold, I wish I had gone slower. My studio apartment has become quite boring lately. When I first moved in, it only housed a robot's essentials, an outlet, though I only need to recharge once or twice a week. Since then, Robert has brought over a cozy couch. He likes to have somewhere to sit when he comes over. And I brought a TV to cover the wall opposite. Stacks of books crawl up my walls, some borrowed from Robert and some from the ancient library two cities over. These used to entertain me at night, but once read, I can replay them from memory. It's the same for the boxes of old movies I have collected. Still, I like to rewatch them. I pick up on something new every time I examine an actor's behavior. I'll admit, everything I know about feminine flirting, I learned from the movies. Television shows are what I look forward to the most every night. Fortunately, I have a few episodes to catch up on, which should entertain me for a couple hours. So that selection just introduces you to kind of to her character and the first shady situation that goes down in the story. Um, it picks up about four days later when she realizes that she hasn't talked to um, Robert in four days and she realizes that something's up and she starts her whole investigation. Um, I obviously still, I have, still have some editing to do, but I don't even know how to, okay. Really? There. I still have some editing to do, but my next step would probably be after I finish to look into some places for publication. Um, these are some possible sci-fi magazines. You wouldn't know there were that many, but there's a bunch. And um, obviously the highest goal for me would be Asimov's. Thank <laughs> you.